oh, let's not make the same mistake where for some reason this mic that I have doesn't work. Uh, this video, I figured now that I have, uh, I made a video about uh, making like steps to make towards making life interplanetary with a core uh, focus on my side. My, the, the real states I'm personally invested in are terraformation process of Venus and uh, exploration of Europa, which I would cite as probably the number one candidate outside of Earth, whereby there is the possibility of finding some life form, even if it happens to be on a bacterial level. Um, I would not be surprised if the bacterial life is really, really common throughout the solar system, exception of places like Mars and Venus. But uh, I think other moon, like other planets and some of the moons like Titan and uh, in particular Europe are, are prime candidates for something like that. Uh, maybe even beyond bacteria. However, that is not the purpose of this video. The purpose of this video is to talk about um, the safety aspect and as it relates to life that is engineered and in particular intelligence that is engineered. Uh, yeah, let's be specific because you could have life engineered through some mechanism using synthetic biology or genetics or, well, just kind of go hands in hand like this. Yeah, anyway, so um, I think the term, first of all, artificial intelligence is a little uh, misleading. I say this as a uneducated observer in this space. Um, my interest with the mind in general, uh, the faculties of the mind, um, thinking about thinking has been a big theme in my life, uh, increasingly in my thirties. And now that I'm, uh, like I just turned 41. Um, yeah, but like, say so like all these, like having spent a fair bit of time in the tech industry, um, you know, learning about computers and, um, it's, it, it, I think it was quite inevitable that I was going to start at least exploring the outer boundaries of what we categorize as artificial intelligence. Um, you have a problem with the term itself. I don't think it is artificial. Um, it is another means of enabling intelligence and um, I like Ben Gordzel's, uh, he's not the first, like Ben Gordzel is not the first to use this metaphor. I think Martine Rotlat has also used this metaphor of a, she used a, like the example of the Bernoulli principle, which is the way I understand it, is the principle that's responsible for keeping things afloat. Um, or so when you see something flying, uh, not floating, flying. Uh, the Bernoulli principle, uh, however that works. I don't even know if we know entirely how that really works. And if we've been able to mod model that intricately using physics uh, simulation engines. But uh, yeah, I like that example of using that metaphor in order to be able to like, um, kind of like potentially foresee how things could evolve in the world of intelligence that is modeled. So it's not gonna be like one way, uh, you know, and going back to Gordzel, uh, Gordzel with his recent interview uh, on the Lex Friedman podcast through MIT, he used that example that there's different ways through which we see machines that fly. So you have like airplanes and helicopters and drones and hummingbirds and, you know, a whole bunch of other things and insects and birds in the biological realm that evolution has designed. So the, 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 I guess the point he was trying to drive is uh, that thinking is the same way. It need not be, uh, sorry, intelligence the same way. It need not be something that is, um, it must be something that biology uh, drives. It can be something that may come about through different means. And it's an interesting question. Again, it, you know, it kind of takes you back to uh, the question of thinking about thinking. Um, but that is not the purpose of this talk because uh, uh, I can, yeah, so like, uh, I, I think, um, I, and I've thought about this on and off, like uh, the book that got me started thinking on AI is, I think it's Kevin Warwick's book on AI. I think it's called AI Basics. 
yeah, it's called Artificial Intelligence, The Basics by Kevin Warwick. Uh, I think that's how you say his last name. Um, if you are looking for the um, different topics in the wider subject of um, artificial intelligence, then this is kind of like a framework. It's kind of like a, uh, almost like an index of sorts and there's like short chapters that describe each one of the different areas within the uh, subject of artificial intelligence. Uh, obviously there's like tons of other resources. A lot of people like Society uh, of Mind, Society of the Mind by Marvin Minsky. Uh, most of the lectures are publicly available now through the MIT OpenCourseWare or just YouTube site. There's an entire playlist dedicated for that. Uh, more recently, the Lex Friedman podcast is quite educational. Uh, I find I can uh, at least begin to wrap my mind around uh, some of the stuff that the um, speakers are talking about. Obviously, I don't have the depth or understanding from a comp sci mathematics or other principles in order to be able to uh, digest everything in its entirety. But uh, yeah, these are some of the um, a resource I can think of. Um, it seems like there's been a flurry of activity in this space from the perspective of how, um, so like when it comes to artificial intelligence, we generally have three domains and there's the, if you kind of think of this, I think I'm getting this from Warwick's book just to give credit where it's due. But if you could think of a wider circle, which would encapsulate human level intelligence modeled um, as a circle that would be categorized as AGI, which stands for artificial general intelligence. So to the best of my ability, or sorry, to, like, based on what I know, AGI is still something we are working on as a species. Uh, there are different estimates with respect to when we're gonna get there. The estimate um, about a decade ago, something like that used to be 2045 was the general consensus, but the variance when it comes to making these predictions, was anywhere from 200 years to the year 2045, uh, or even like the next 10 years, like, you know, like Gordzel, individuals like Ben Gordzel have predicted that it can happen in 10 years if we try really, really hard, paraphrasing one of the quotes he uh, mentioned. So that, yeah, that's the variance when it comes to getting to artificial general intelligence. Within the subset and what we have today, because we use... AI on a daily basis, you use it when you're using Siri, um, when you're using voice to text translations on Google, uh, there's a cluster of near AIs probably working in the background uh, in order to be able to translate natural language into something that the machine can understand, you know, do the set of uh, tasks, algorithms that need to be executed to extract the data you're looking for and Converted well. This at this point, it's all converted. So to bring that result back. So that's self-driving cars. Another example. Um, we're using. Uh, so so now the distinction is. Sorry, I should talk about the uh, the uh, the categories first. Like we've got the like you know there's taking steps to AGI. So that's the artificial general intelligence level. Um, it, it's it's widely accepted that once we get to human level general intelligence, then super intelligence is not gonna to be too far off, um, which seems like a very logical uh, assumption to make, um, but it's also contingent on, in my opinion, how the, and, and, like how the thing or entity or the intelligence evolves, what kind of data sets does it have access to? Is it connected to certain data repositories, how is it evolving? It's like a whole series of questions that come into play when it comes to making these set of predictions. Um, but yeah, like conceivably, I could see something going from human level intelligence to super intelligence in a rather short amount of time because if there aren't necessarily a lot of barriers from the perspective. So we're talking about like things like computation, how, many, how much computation resources we have, 
or this entity has and how, how like, you know, what, what are the, what, how is the learning actually set up? Is it supervised, unsupervised? Is it in the realm of unsupervised and there's enough computation available? Is it, is this thing, like, you know, is, is the AI uh, entity going to be able to learn really fast? So there's, I think at least at the very level, these parameters involved. But uh, again, conceivably speaking, I do not see any roadblocks with respect to uh, the thing going to. Now there's a counter argument to something like this. I think this comes from Danielle Dennett. And uh, I think Dennett's of the opinion that machine intelligence, uh, even I, I, I actually couldn't do justice paraphrasing this quote and I forget where exactly he said this, but it was something along the lines of the first generation of general purpose machines are gonna be pretty dumb. Uh, I could also see that happening. So it depends how you enable the set of realities that give rise to this engineered intelligence. So yeah, that's like the scope in terms of the predictions and like what could potentially come about in terms of the landscape we're looking at. And now that being said, to come back to the overall area. So that's AGI, then you have uh, machine learning and deep learning. So like if you were thinking of circles within circles, I think the way it goes is AGI, then you've got a smaller circle there called machine learning and even smaller subset within that. So it's like an area within an area. So AGI, mach machine learning, and then deep learning. These are the three areas that uh, are that or have been in existence uh, in the domain of AGI. I'm trying to pull this off from memory, so I should probably prepare more for live videos. Now, not to sound all that. Now, uh, the, from the perspective of history, there used to be something called the um, symbolic school. And I think this is more in the realms, uh, in the realm of things like uh, expert systems and whatnot. Uh, things that could parse through lists and make sense out of stuff. Uh, work has been undergoing in the domain of neural networks. I do not know the entire history of neural networks. I just know it's been going on for a couple of decades. Um, a lot of people did not believe neural networks were gonna work. And just as a super quick explanation of what a neural network may be, it is a computer network whereby we simulate how a neuron in the brain would function. So like a super crude example, the way I understand it is you have modeled a neuron in software and you attach certain weights to uh, the, the how this neuron's actually gonna parse through information and then you connect different neurons together now we're at this level whereby we can do multi-layer neural networks. But basically you have data coming in, the neural network parses through the data in order to be able to make sense out of what's coming into the system. So there's like things like weights and biases and whatnot that are uh, part of this overall design of neural networks. Today, there are many different kinds of neural networks. There's uh, GANs and there's like um, KNNs, which I learned about today. There's like CNNs, which stands for con convolution neural networks. There, there's a lot of other types of neural networks uh, that like, you know, there's different neural networks that perform uh, different set of tasks. And so this I think is in the domain of the connectionist school. So you went kind of went from more of a symbolic school to more of a, what seems like now is more of a connectionist school. Um, in order to be able to bring about the um, uh, kind of uh, innovations we're seeing in the domain of uh, uh, well, deep learning and uh, overall field of machine learning. So this is where uh, we, uh, in a very, very crude and uh, rough estimation uh, or like encapsulation, I don't know what the right words are, but that's where we currently stand with uh, what is in the known uh, set of developments uh, and um, so my video is about uh, safe 
intelligence. Uh, I don't mean intelligence in a, uh, um, like, you know, you have military and intelligence, although these institutions also use, make use of AI and probably all the leading and developing nations are heavily investing in this area. I'm talking about bottled uh, intelligence. So again, the distinction that I started with is not, I'm not talking about model life. I'm talking about modeled intelligence uh, or engine, engineer, the, the intel, intelligence that is substrate independent. Uh, it's not related to the cranium that biology has powered. It's something that we can engineer and model. Um, I'm gonna like, to kind of like not like I think I've spent too much time like explaining the background. You can just read books and get a glimpse of what the history of uh, AI development looks like. There's probably videos on this on the internet as well. Um, what is my take on this topic? Uh, well, I am a singularitarian. I've kind of gone back and forth with this topic, so my views are very biased. Obviously, I. Uh, um, I, my intuitive guess has always been, I'm, I'm a huge, uh, I've, I've been uh, really influenced by the, I guess if you want to call it philosophies of Ray Kurzweil. So it's, uh, Ray Kurzweil has been a huge influence with regards to how I think about this topic. So I want to put that out as a, I guess, I just, I want it, I want it, I want it to be known that my thinking on this topic is hugely influenced by what I've read from Curse, Mr. Kurzweil, which is started with the age of spiritual machines and most of the singularity is near, uh, you know, how to create a mind. I was able to like completely wrap my mind around some of the mathematics, uh, mathematical concepts that are explored in uh, the book. But yeah, hugely influenced by the Kurzweilian line of thinking, philosophy. Um, the reason why I've gone back and forth on this topic is because of just uh, just being an observer of my own thoughts and also human, uh, just being super honest about this. I am a human being, so I've also made mistakes, uh, but also kind of looking at the world, the way it is, um, I think I tend to, uh, I want to be challenged on it because if I say I I I, I think I, I, like if I say it without like I, I I'm on the optimistic end of the spectrum then that doesn't that means I'm not challenging myself. Well, but I think I tend to uh, like being like you know have a optimistic uh, approach to the future. I had a very good childhood. My parents have been wonderful. I grew up in three countries and I have a pretty good uh, all all around life. Entrepreneurial journey has been very difficult, uh, but I'm not uh, complaining about that. These are choices I made. And, um, but yeah, like specific to AI, um, it seems like a superpower. Uh, so I'm like, you know, again, being a, a student, uh, not necessarily, but just being a student of human uh, behavior and just kind of looking at the world the way it is. I just like, kind of like, mm, are we really ready for this? Uh, that being said, I think it's, I think it's inevitable that a intelligence that is modeled is going to emerge on this planet in the solar system sometime between now and the next 20 years. I'd be, I'd be really surprised if it takes longer than that. Um, but if you want to go in terms of Probably like if you if you're talking about probabilistic terms, I would put like an eighty percent chance that intelligence is modeled is going to emerge within the next fifteen years or less, and then I'll put a twenty percent. I don't know how like I haven't thought about the probability so much, but I would put a twenty percent chance that is going to happen between like you know so like. 2040s to 2060s. I don't. I, I don't see it happening, like way out in the future, um, unless something like you know. I think Sam Harris said it like, it's like, like I, actually I don't, I don't know if Sam Harris said this exactly. So I, I should not say this, but I, like unless something like uh, like you know some, something happens, like we roll back technology, which which is going to be a terrible 
thing, uh, in my opinion. A lot of people are going to die. Um, there's just no way to support uh, a system of 7 billion people without the core set of technologies that we use today um, being continually developed and, uh, well, used and developed, making use of them and developing them further. So yeah, that's my, uh, I, I should posit that there is a possibility that the technological singularity already happened. Now, I'm not gonna try and explain the technological singularity because I may do a bad job at it. Uh, if I was gonna attempt to try and describe a technological singularity, then I would classify it as a point in time whereby we have been able to model intelligence within machines. And I think I've made, I've made like at least a reference to the technological singularity in some of my other uh, posts on Quora. I may have spoken about this in some of the other videos, but the term has been borrowed from the term singularity, which comes from the world of physics. So when we have black holes, which the way I understand it is a gravity or like a gravitational well that's so strong that actually punctures through or ruptures or does something to the fabric of space-time. So if, if space-time was a plane, then black holes would, you know, like you have like a sheet of rubber or plastic or something and like it's stretched out, something like rubber is stretched out, right? Like a balloon, like it's a, it's a really big balloon and when you stretch it out, but when you put your finger down like this, then it kind of makes a depression, like kind of like a gravity well. So you can kind of think of space-time. I don't think space-time is really like that with the nature of um, reality itself. We're like, we're like everything's made up of uh, quantum particles and like super particles and whatnot. We don't know, like maybe quantum foam. So and you like all these wormholes, like potentially connecting different areas of space-time. So the nature of true nature of reality may be pretty queer, but like if you're trying to dumb this down, just think of space time as a plane, then gravity does something to space time. I don't know if it punctures it or just makes a depression, like what's really going on there. I want to be educated on the actual nature of black holes, but there is a point in black holes. Uh, it's that's I think what the math leads up to, which is like. You know, like, like when information passes through the black holes, like there were really a lot of, like, I don't like, it depends on the size of the black hole, what's really happening to something that's passing through the black hole. There's like, you know, a lot of questions like that, but when like, stuff goes to the point of singularity, I think that's the point by which you cannot return. I think that's uh, what uh, the singularity point really means. Uh, like I said, would like to be educated on it. So, the term technological singularity is bored from it, but my interpretation of technological singularity is that you, uh, you have like a point whereby technological maturity has reached a particular level. And in this realm, uh, we have the means to be able to model uh, intelligence and this intelligence is going to evolve past this point. So um, I think that subset is a conversation by itself. My thoughts on this right now are that there's going to be steps to the singularity, right? Which are probably running in parallel to, if I think steps to AGI is the same thing as steps to the technological singularity keeping like those two hypotheses into consideration or the prediction that it's either going to be human level intelligence and super intelligence or like Dennett, I think Dennett has said, said, said this, the first set of AGIs are actually gonna be really dumb and it's gonna require, I'm building up on this hypothesis if it is really again Dennett, that it's gonna take many iterations and only be able to get to machines that at least start operating at the same scale as uh, a human with average level intelligence. But uh, yeah, so that's my, I think, interpretation of something that is a, uh, let's, uh, that's how I would look at the technological thing. The, the point I was trying to make is like, so that's these two 
scenarios considered. I need some water, but this is a live video. <laughs> oh, I'll have some tea. Sorry, just one second. Um, yeah, it's, it's hard to say what's going to happen right after the point of uh, technological singularity contingent on the, again, the two set of scenarios. So between the two scenarios, there's a space. So you can, like, you can explore all these different possibilities within the space, but it's really hard to uh, hypothesize, like it's hard to imagine what's gonna happen right after. Um, it's like asking, it's like asking like, um, it's like going back 66 million years and asking the shrew that we uh, evolved from, like well, how will computers change the world around you? Like, like, I don't know, like I can't come up with a good example, but it's really hard to imagine what would happen after this uh, period in time. Uh, so what can we, I, and, and so like what should happen is the question. Uh, like my uneducated take on this is, again, contingent on the hypotheses that the technological singularity is not something that already happened. Like now, if the technological singularity already happened, then it begets a question that what kind of entities are here in this universe, right? And how do we interact with them? Which opens up another series of questions. I also look at the technological singularity as kind of like an antenna. Um, or like a very clever set of um, translators, uh, which will allow us to potentially unlock new uh, realms in reality and maybe create antennas for us to be able to talk to other intelligences out there. And my personal take on this is that between now and the future, contingent on the assumption that we will keep evolving in a flesh and blood format. I know it sounds a little weird when I say this, but um, if you actually think about modeling intelligence and then you think about realities that are indistinguishable from this reality, it doesn't seem, and then you think about perception and like how to model perception that again is indistinguishable from uh, these set of experiences, then it, it, the, the thought doesn't seem that crazy at least. So, you know, like, again, contingent on the hypothesis that we keep evolving in this flesh and blood format. If that happens to be true, then I think uh, this is where Hugo de Guerres kind of comes in and he talks about the cyborg, sorry, the human cyborgian, and he calls it the artelect. Uh, it's like at least three different groups. And I think within these groups, I think something like that will happen. Uh, depends on the time scale. But I also think that there's gonna be gradients between these three groups, right? So like if you've got a non-enhanced human, it's like, how are you gonna uh, model that? And then you have cyborgs with other senses and abilities and uh, the ability to also be able to talk to the artilex, uh, however that happens. And then you have like there's going to be a like a range um like when it comes to the communications between at least the cyborgian and the art intellect level there's going to be a whole range of uh and classes and types of different beings uh, whereas human evolution would still be kind of largely driven by natural selection as it has been so the things i don't agree with or i hope don't happen is some of the dystopian stuff. Oh, um, like I'm not a huge uh, Hugo de Guerres. Uh, like I haven't looked up, I haven't read his books. I uh, I know he's working on some research on the beyond the nanoscale mathematical framework for tech um, or like just the mathematical framework for scales beyond the nano level. So he's a smart guy, but like uh, some of his views are controversial. Uh, including the view of uh, what he uh, categorizes as a gigadeth. Uh, so 
de Guerres is of the opinion that there will be a time in the future. So he kind of splits the three kind of realities in two specific groups. And the groups are the Cosmos and the Terrans. And the Terrans would be individuals who would want to live on Earth. They want to think, I'm, I, I'm, I hope I'm doing, because I don't want to like quote someone and then do a bad job at trying to explain what they mean. You can just go and Google like some of the stuff that DeGaris has to say and form your own conclusions. But the way I understand Terran and Cosmic set of realities are going to uh, come about the way DeGaris explains them, I'm just going to close one of these tabs, is that, um, yeah, like Terrans would want to continue living on Earth. They wouldn't want something like an AGI to develop, whereas the Cosmos would want to expand through the farther reaches of the solar system and then beyond that, the galaxy. So they would welcome a technological development that could help them do something like that. And uh, yeah, so he like kind of get, gets into a fair bit of detail of how all that's going to come about. We could, uh, they're going to have like spies in each other's camps and, you know, there's going to be some uh, bad things happening because uh, they're going to try and subvert each other's uh, work. Um, but they will also have like, again, spies in each other's camps. So, uh, you know, they're like, so anyways, so I, 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 De Garris predicts there's going to come a time where a lot of people are going to die because there's going to be an all out war between Cosmos and Terrence. Um, yeah. So, like I will refrain from actually commenting on this um, because uh, it's like a, it is not a criticism of a way of thinking, uh, um, but it seems like very binary, very linear. Um, the thing that worries me about, and like historically I've all like super like, I, I still am. I'm still, I, I would like, if I was to choose one of these camps, I would choose the Cosmos camp. Uh, Cause there's so much to explore in the universe and just this galaxy. And I'd love to explore uh, all of these different areas, but I wouldn't want it to come at the expense of uh, anything. Uh, even the suffering of uh, like a creature that we do not deem as uh, human, like a, chicken or like an insect. Uh, I, I, I wouldn't want that kind of suffering to come about. Uh, I, I don't think there has to be this distinction and the classification, even though some of them may come about, but I don't think there has to be necessarily an all out war. And, you know, all these things have to play out in exactly like uh, De Garris, um predicts that they're gonna happen. The thing that being said, I, I'm just trying to like paint the, or like uh, showcase the landscape whereby like uh, based on the very little I know about this, I haven't gone through like all of the podcasts from MIT AGI, like Lex Friedman or like a lot of books or research papers to be able to like expand on this considerably. But in my mind, the landscape, the patch, like the one of the patches of the landscape kind of looks like this. And, um, what I'm saying is it doesn't have to be that way. Uh, my take on this subject is I think right now there's a lot of, uh, we have a sick planet. So we have people who are uh, sick in their physiology and there's a variety of reasons why that's happening. People are living in slums. They're living on top of huts that are on top of, like what looks like sewage water and like places like Nigeria and a lot of other places in the world. Um, there's a lack of healthcare facilities. Uh, just like, it's an, and the healthcare facilities that we do have uh, to my uneducated, like Canada is really good when it comes to a lot of these things. Canada is like probably one of the best places to live from this perspective along with the Nordic countries. But a lot of we're still dark when it comes to basic things like healthcare. A big part of that is accessible mental health related services. And I think 
a lot of the world is dark when it comes to trying to figure out what is going on in your mind in a mechanism that has some probability of yielding results in the domain of evidence-based practice. So we're taking a different route, but what I'm saying is that there's still a lot of world that is dark when it comes to accessible mental health. So we got like a whole host of issues uh, in this arena and it's a very complex problem. And it's not just a problem of mental health itself. Uh, there's all these other problems that need to be solved in terms of food, water, shelter, the means to be able to have, uh, you know, provide individuals uh, a means to be able to access information, like some kind of computation device, global security. Uh, it's like a whole cluster of problems that we have in a way, like, so like global integration or at least cooperation. Um, uh, well, we've we got like other issues coming our way in terms of the state of the ocean, the climate itself, um, biodiversity or loss thereof and loss of the rainforest because we're chopping them down for palm oil and whatnot. So like a whole cluster of problem exists. And like specific to this topic, because this is on the topic of AI safety, where I'm going with this thought is there's a lot of work world again that's dark what it relates to the, the topic of mental health. So once we do have like an intelligence or super intelligence, I think the resistance, this is my personal take, I could be very wrong in making up this topic. And this topic in particular should not be construed as me saying that the topic of the larger topic of AI safety should not be taken seriously. I'm not saying that at all. But what I, what I think could be happening is because we have a reality on earth whereby a lot of people think it's either taboo to just seek help from the perspective of mental health or that they may be unconsciously afraid of going into parts of their mind. Cause I don't think you have one mind, you have like different minds and um, you know, like these cluster of memories that kind of enable different spaces in your mind. And like some spaces are scary. So like a lot of people are scared to go in those spaces and, as a result of not doing that in a controlled environment, people numb uh, their senses because it's scary uh, parts of your brain. But the problem is if all of what I'm saying is true, it ought to be categorized as true. Then um, Yeah, that's like, so uh, it, it kind of makes logical sense. Like if, oh, so I was going to say these, a lot of these thoughts are not conscious. So like when humans, like, this is coming again from a very uneducated perspective, I have no data to be able to back up these hypotheses with, but uh, I think humans do the things that do in the demands of um, mental health issues and uh, even addictions, because there may be some part of their brain that, or mind, sorry, that they do not want to face. Now, uh, in the beginning of this comment, not, not to suggest that, you know, neuro, like, uh, uh, I'm not, uh, uh, something that actually comes about as a result of like something related to neurophysiology, like something physiological in the brain that could be causing some of these ailments or conditions uh, is not in the scope of this subtopic because that's in the domain of this physio physiological side of things, obviously. There, would, there are different parts of the brain responsible for different things and there would be an effect of some sort of what one saying is like when it comes to like issues related to memories and some of them now are painful memories, then uh, there may be resistance on part of a fairly substantial uh, amount of the population. Like, I don't know what the numbers would be in this domain, but uh, this is my assumption. There's a lot of folks who's like, well, this seems like there's a lot of trauma in the world and uh, obviously, um, People are mean to each other and, you know, you know like uh, people do all sorts of these things. Uh, I don't think a lot of people would do these things if they were truly conscious of what set of memories were in their system in the first place and how those set of memories were impacting their overall schema, which I don't know how this all works and how that in turn impacts their behavior. And, you know, you kind of categorize all that 
in the domain of cognition. I use, I like to use the word cognition. I don't like to use the word consciousness uh, with Jeffrey Hinton that there's probably no thing as consciousness uh, unless proven otherwise. He doesn't say that, but that's, I'm just adding it to this that, yeah, I don't, I don't think there's anything like a, I don't mean this is a disrespect or to challenge somebody's belief system or anything like that, not at all. This is just my opinion that there's probably no such thing as consciousness the way we describe it, unless you mean like a set of mechanisms that actually boot up cognition. So yeah, anyways, that being said, I think this is like a detour, but to come back to the topic, what I think could be happening is because there is a general inability to make sense out of our own thoughts and like, you know, like unconscious thoughts and whatnot. And there may be something in our minds that we do not want to face. I think the res this kind of somehow plays into the resistance we are maybe seeing to the development of artificial intelligence. Because in a, like, it, it just seems like a rational thing to explore what something like this could be. How do we go about making it? How do we go about making this safe? And, you know, like look at mapping the landscape in terms of what our technological evolution has been to date. Uh, which stage is it at right now? And what could it potentially be in the future? Which is like overwhelmingly driven by mostly physics, but also a, a, like a lot of these, like a lot of the other subjects in the domain of social sciences and uh, liber uh, liberal arts would also be enormously feeding into this, uh, uh, this I guess, this, uh, mechanism or cycle in a, in a contributory sense. But yeah, like, I think what is happening in general though is this, this like one of the key points I've been thinking about is because of the general inability to make sense out of what may be in our own minds, we unconsciously project these fears and as it relates to the development of AI. And maybe it has something to do with how the limbic brain is fashioned, like by no way, shape or form, I'm not saying the limbic brain, like don't, I hope nobody takes my words out of context, like saying this is bad, that is good. This is not a, like it's, it's not a binary conversation or this is bad or like, you know, but it must, like this specifically this comment, this must be something in our limbic system or, you know, like how that works in conjunction with uh, the memories that we classify as that we don't want to deal with it. Somehow this cycle plays into projecting this in AI because it's not inconceivable that we're going to see like development of some kind of modeled intelligence. Let's just use the word model intelligence or intelligence that is not, that's not substrate independent or I can just use AI. It's like I, I've only shared why I don't like using that term because I don't think there's going to be anything artificial about that. Uh, especially that, it, that when it's like part and parcel of how we do things, how are that's going to come about maybe through brain machine interfaces or some uh, external or um, internal module of sorts. I don't know, like our technology is going to be also hard to share that, but th th this is going to become a, like a, it's going to become part of it. We're going to become a part of uh, whatever is going to come about. So uh, to classify that as intelligence, as artificial would be to classify ourselves as artificial. It kind of, sort of, maybe that's a wrong way of reasoning about this. But what I'm trying to get to is, yeah, well, that would be this logical series of things to do as opposed to, uh, oh, I was going to say, that it's not inconceivable that there may come a time in the near future whereby we have uh, further breakthroughs in the domain of uh, brain machine interfaces. We're uh, able to actually ne uh, read uh, neural, neural uh, can never say the word, neuronal uh, activity from the neurons itself. Uh, right now it seems like a dance of like complex and random, um, you know, like things firing here and there. But what if we can actually make cohesive sense out of what's really going on? And this would put us in the domains of, you know, like it's gonna be a much more nuanced and uh, efficient mechanism of actually reading minds. I, and I think this is where maybe the problem uh, could 
like they, like I, I think we're gonna see resistance in this domain. I'm thinking, I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, maybe we won't. Uh, so hard to say without actually conducting polls on this subject and see how people, it depends on how the questions are also structured. But um, yeah, so it's, I, I don't see it. Like I, 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 like I could see if something is improving on some gradient, then I could see the ability to be able to peer into any mind and modeling any mind and uh, building a rich set of tools where I can pick and choose different filters and I'll be able to see what's going on and not just different segments of time, but kind of go into specific areas. Uh, I'm talking about memories here. So you'll see how that set of memories are impacting behavior and cognition. So I don't see any potential roadblocks towards doing that, uh, provided that the technological evolution or path that we're on keeps, it, it remains, it, it keeps going in that direction. Um, it's not gonna come from one arena, it's gonna come from different arenas contributing to this, but uh, I don't see a reason why a, it doesn't even have to be intelligent. Uh, you could just do this in um, without. Uh, you could just do this with software and like uh, a better ability to be able to read these set of activities. So that's a conversation by itself. I don't expand on that too much. But what I'm really saying is that I think we project our own unconscious fears and. Uh, Yeah, it's mostly that, that we're projecting when it comes to coming in contact with um, something uh, that's intelligent that we may have to, like, you know, there's going to be a merger of, like, our cognition with it. So I think that is where most of the resistance to general level intelligence may be coming from. Now, this is separate from the actual issue of AI safety. I think, I don't know how you want to categorize it. This could be part of the overall narrative. Probably should be because if, you know, the sentiment turns against something like this, then it's actually bad for our long-term future, the way I look at it, because we have all this data and I don't think there's enough humans to be able to make sense out of all this enormous amount of data we're generating and trying to glean insights from it that would be good for and better for our long-term future. So I think there's like, you know, considering the evolution of uh, computation, technology in general, miniaturization, a whole bunch of other factors, I think it's pretty inevitable that the uh, there's gonna be some kind of super intelligence or maybe dumb intelligence that is general. will go back to those two classifications from Dennett, that something like that is gonna be evolving. Now, to come to the actual issue of AI safety in, this was kind of like a, like a landscape, kind of attempt at drawing a landscape, but to come to the actual issue of AI safety, I think we have to be like really careful about who gets this breakthrough and uh, what do they intend to use with it. Uh, or so, what, what, what would be their intentional purpose for using this? Uh, yeah, I'm like, I, I, I'm not, I'm not like um, coming at this with a very strong stance. I think um, yeah, I, I'm like my personal opinion is like uh, this technology is like a superpower potentially and like just like it would not have been a very good thing to keep the internet to like 10,000 people or 100,000 people or a million people at the most around the world. The same principle applies here. It would not be a good thing to keep something like a modeled intelligence uh, and and only have like a core group of people who have access to this. Uh, we have to, uh, 
you know, like there's, there's going to be a whole like series of pros and cons that are going to kick in and people are going to say, well, look at all the things that happen on the internet that are not nice. But I don't, well, we, the, those conversations and many others should be had, but I don't think it's a good idea to, again, retain uh, something like this if and when it does happen to a small uh, group of people uh, because something like that would only just, I don't see good things coming out of that. Um, yeah, like you know, it's like a huge set of sub in terms of liberties and freedoms and uh, what really powers growth in an enlightened sense and uh, cycles of innovation. You know, even if you can foreseeably or very um, cogently or like mathematically predict uh, how certain kind of resources can be had on a time spectrum with respect to how population increase may be had and like how life will evolve. I still don't think it's a good idea to keep uh, something like this. This is all, this is becoming very thought experimenty at this point. But yeah, I still don't think it's, it would be a good idea to keep the uh, technology like, you know, like only a certain amount of people have access. Like a quote from Carl Sagan comes to my mind from the book Demon Haunted World, Science as a Candle in the Dark, where he is, um, it, he's kind of like describing what the future of the United States may be in the future. He's like talking about like, you know, like a lot of the um, quality jobs have shipped away or in, and nobody's in the public sphere is able to cogently describe let alone like questions sorry let, let alone describe uh issues related to science and tech when everyone inherently depends on science and tech. i can't i'm not doing justice and i'm just i'm the making of the comments not to suggest it's not a actual uh criticism of uh, the cycles of science and tech in the united states or any other part of the world uh just, that's what sagan uh, predicted but one of the parts of the quote was and he was saying and he says in the same, I think it's the same quote we were saying, it's like only a handful of people that have access to advanced technology, something along those lines. So, and that's what I'm actually is like saying right now. It would be the same with this, with nanotech, with like a lot of other breakthroughs that have uh, the capacity to um, have so much positive change in the world. I don't think it's, it's actually a bad idea to keep it under the wraps and uh, keep it tight knit and uh, at the same time it's probably not a good idea to like broadcast this to the entire world openly I don't know like I don't know what the opposite is how science is really done how open is it uh, I don't know like which one of these like you know, I, I'm not in the camp of like locking things down and only a handful of people having access to it i don't think of like all the different possibly like, even if i'm one of those people i have access to it i still don't would not want this kind of reality because i don't think it's a good reality for some of the reasons i shared and more at the same time i don't like like i think the open model makes sense but i think the open model should be done in a way whereby you live in transparency or a transparent uh like the, the mechanism which we wish the government's operate should be 100% transparent unless it comes to actual issues of like uh, national security or something that if you release it could cause a lot of panic or chaos in the public. So like, you know, like within reason, but largely speaking, how the government manages state funds and uh, taxpayer money and uses it to like fund a whole bunch of endeavors, all this information should be publicly available. Uh, Again, within reason, like, you know, the identities of all the folks serving in critical groups, just something should be like heavily protected and guarded. So, so that element of transparency is absolutely necessary within reason. I share some examples. I think the model for the future should involve some 
element of radical transparency. And uh, this is a series of thoughts I've had. I haven't, I haven't, I haven't actually finished the Transparent Society by David Brin. I haven't finished reading it, so I can't ex extra, uh, expand on this too much. But I could appreciate something like if the blockchain does become like a global, so say like instead of like cloud-based technologies, you have like a, like a series of global distributed computing architectures and you can tap into these computational systems for super cheap. So then, you know, you have a potential reality whereby uh, you could like in effect have something like a very transparent society. This would be like a core component of a transparent society. And so there's a couple of things here with respect to like innovation cycles and powering abundance and including abundance of time for a lot of people and having a vibrant middle class and sustainability. Like, you know, there's like a lot of these factors whereby something like this would contribute to this radical transparency because you need a lot of people to be looking at like data set DLC, what kind of patterns do we need to focus on or are we able to keep these cycles going for us, but also like intent, you know, like, intent is something that is, you don't need like an entire army, like looking at intent all the time. Like, you can bake something like that in, in part of the user design, like in how we operate some of the, the machines from like an endpoint perspective in the first place. All, these are all different conversations. But uh, yeah, I don't, I don't like, so I, I think it's better to think of a more transparent society versus uh, the other model. And this was a off and like, this is gonna go off in different branches, but to roll back, this all started with um, thinking about the topic of AI safety. I don't know if I made this topic more complicated or less co complicated, but um, yeah, what I'm trying to say is a few people on earth should not have access to this. The access should be democratized, but the way you democratize the access matters. Uh, is a very important issue. Access in the hands of the few, or maybe one really not good person uh, would probably be the foreboarding. Uh, it could be like the precursor of something bad. Uh, even if you give that access to like the most well-intentioned per, per, per person in the world, when they have that level of power or ability in their hands we don't know like what this thing is going to be able to power like you know that kind of stuff could uh, be abused and that person could become like a Darth Vader of some sort or worse and then it's going to be bad uh, and then uh, we don't know what it, what the unintended consequences of like certain models like models like that are going to be because you know like if you have like a super intelligent person and then you give them or like something like, you know, high IQ, whatever, like how, how you model intelligence, like uh, you have this person and maybe their psychology is like not ideal and then they get access to this technology, then bad things could happen is, is what I'm saying. So I don't, I don't know, I shouldn't laugh at this, but um, uh, I'm laughing because like, it seems like for me to do a take on this topic seems kind of like, I don't know what I'm talking about, um, but I think, um, yeah, it, I, th I think it's a very important issue. Uh, yeah, I'm, like, I'm not gonna get into the specifics. Like if you look at the overall consensus, then uh, most of the folks in the, well, kind of like on the periphery or inside the, actually I can't say this because I don't know like what the take is from me um, overall standpoint but there was this one talk where there's like elon musk and ray kurzweil is also in the panel and there's a whole bunch of other folks and they did a take i think sam harris was the host i forget but the question i think sam harris was asking the memories he was a couple of years old he was asking if you believe the outcome is going to be good in the future respect to ai safety and everybody was positive and or so, so it was something like, are you in favor or in opposition? I think that was it versus the outcome is going to be good. And most of the people said we're in favor of further developing. And Elon Musk was the only one who said like an outright no. 
So I'm not going to take a tangent and talk about Elon Musk's um, take on this. But uh, I think Musk is going with a very uneducated guess is Musk talks about, uh, he talks about this in a mathematical sense, uh, at least that's the way I'm like interpret this situation. Like we're, we're talking about like the probability. So, you know, like he talks about like probabilistic outcomes and then he's, like uh, the, the the specific quote from Elon Musk is there's very fruit. I could I could be wrong about this. I can sort of try to pull it from memory. I, I could I could be wrong about a lot of things that I'm talking about here. Uh, but he's saying that there are very few probabilistic outcomes whereby the emergence of AGI level intelligence is actually going to be good for humans. So somebody correct me if I'm wrong in making this observation. But I think that's what Musk's Musk's Elon Musk's stances on this topic. So I would want to see those mathematical probabilities. Then I'd, I'd, what I'd want to do in that case is learn more about statistics and probabilities, probability more so in this case, which I don't know much about, you know a little bit about statistics. And then I put a team together, like a different just a set of teams and really see what's really going on here. Like how are we constructing these data sets in order to be able to come arise at these um, conclusions because you can you can set up your data sets in, in a certain way to be able to give you a certain view of uh, certain outcomes but if we could strip a lot of these biases away from what we're talking about and just look at the issue as is I don't know if we're going to be able to do that because I don't know how that's po possible there's always some kind of bias in a system I'm not, I'm not too like sure of how you actually model this and ma mathematically and like, can, can, cannot elaborate on this too much. But if you could, then I think that would be the way of actually um, um, begin the process of actually like figure out what, like how would this go about? <sighs> yeah, so the issue of AI safety is something that in my opinion is going to require uh, global effort. Uh, uh, for a while as an, an educated person in this realm, I'm kind of gone back and forth uh, with regards to if it will even be possible uh, At this time, like I'm going with very little information. I could be wrong again about everything, almost exclusively everything. But at this time, to me, it looks like this is going to happen sometime within the next 10, 15 years. Again, if it hasn't happened already. So it, it, it seems very important to have the initial set of conditions right. However, intelligence is going to evolve in an engineer sense in the future. Um, meaning, what, what will we really see the rise of super intelligent machines that have the ability to feel senses and emotions or emotions and feelings and whatnot, including spiritual experiences, whatever that means. That's, that's uh, different folks have different interpretations of what ought to be categorized as a spiritual experience. It's either going to be like with like the spectrum is like that or dumb AIs, like, you know, like village idiot kind of level or like somewhere in between is like data from Star Trek. So yeah, there's like a whole spectrum in between these realities. So, um, yeah, so it, the initial conditions have to be taught off. Um, I was on the forum the other day and somebody was talking about the feelings of this. The, this is, the comment was conscious. Like, is this thing conscious? It, like, you know, and a lot of what Kurzweil, Mr. Kurzweil shared in the age of spiritual machine, I think applies in this situation because if the entity is saying I'm conscious, I'm able to feel these things and, uh, you know, is, is able to operate on the same scale as human when it comes to like a lot of different 
abilities that a adult human has, then in my opinion, the machine is conscious. So the, now the question is more in the domains of uh, rights and the rights of mind files or how are ETOMs going to be modeled. And Martin wrote that, it's written a book on this subject, uh, beginning to explore this topic in a structured manner. It's called Virtually Human by Martin Rothblatt again. But yeah, like the thing is conscious, it says it's conscious, um, then it's conscious. And we have to talk about rights and freedoms for this entity versus creating some art, like some weird construct through which we're pumping like a gazillion requests and scaling up the computational abilities for this thing and saying, solve my problems, which is most likely going to make this thing go crazy. Um, I think Asimov has explored this theme in one of his books. Not sure. Because uh, in the last question, Multivax was the thing that, like, like you know, or like looking at potential future scenario where uh, the universe is suffering a cold death, the entropy is increasing, stars are dying out, so the engineers or the humans or whatever, like the future of life is, uh, uh, they've given this construct, this supercomputer a task and they're saying, how do we reverse entropy? And the machine keeps saying insufficient data in order to be able to compute or something like that. But then it finally does that. But by that time, all the life is like, it's too late, but like, it looks like it's like the reference to something and looks like the universe kind of starts again. But I think I haven't read this other book, but uh, to kind of build up on my point, I think there was another work of Asimov whereby multivax indeed goes crazy. It goes like insane. And uh, that could be a potential reality if we do create this super cluster of AIs and you know, however life is kind of evolves in three gradients like the cyborgs and uh, sorry, human cyborgs and artilex or you know, the, uh, you know, there's that prospect that some of the artilex may go crazy. So there's like different takes on all these subjects. Like our, Mar Martin Rothbard believes that if the AIs do go crazy, then we are gonna have AI psychiatrists and psych psychologists. Um, if AI becomes like crazy murderous, we're gonna have AI detectives. Um, but the, we don't have any proof of all, a lot of these things is the thing, right? So we don't know how these things are gonna evolve. I guess what I'm trying to say right now is if I was gonna summarize this whole conversation what would be the two points I would want to summarize this to? I don't think there's only two points, but say if I had to choose two points as an uneducated person, this is, I would think about the initial conditions. I would think of a couple of points. I just do like I would think about the initial conditions really well because the initial conditions I think would determine how the set of realities will evolve that we're going to be intricately connected with. And it's just like it's obviously it has to do with our safety, but it also has to do with the quality of life of the beings that are gonna evolve on this construct. So that's one. Uh, the thoughts and feelings of the beings themselves, that really matters. It's not just about, um, you know, like the optimizations that we'll want to make and a lot of them will make these things do the things that we'd want them to do, design better things or design better rocket ships or, you know, better materials and whatnot. I don't like, I don't know, I guess, it's, or like, entertainment at that. Um, it really matters how uh, the thoughts and feelings of these beings are considered, uh, whether they feel lonely, whether they feel scared or like a set of emotions that they do not want to experience because all of that could and would probably translate into outcomes for us now in the future. And the Asimov uh, kind of landscape was just like one of the potential scenarios there. Um, the other thing we need is, so, um, global cooperation. Um, I don't think anyone should have this much power, uh, honestly. 
because there's no probability that that person is going to go like, you know, going to get that thing, get to their head and uh, start abusing it. Uh, it. It is not inconceivable that some, like that's how the world's probably structured right now. And, you know, the person in, in like, uh, in, like, however this works uh, with these uh, privileges are like, you know, have been carrying their duties to the best of their abilities. Uh, and they have like more of a prime directive kind of approach with, I guess, the rest of us who are living in the zoo. But um, like going forward, I, you know, like the, the thing that worries me is like, oh, there's a lot of, uh, there's a military angle to this. I would say this as a civilian. Um, so all the major nation states are, looks like they made this a big priority for their development. So um, the, the actual development of AI systems is something that it seems to be kick, like, uh, it's become more of a uh, priority. Uh, I don't, I haven't thought about this a lot. Like I am more in the camp of supporting basic research because that is like, is, like if you watch the very first video I made on YouTube many years ago, it's about basic research. That's what got me started thinking, you know, like, like I, that's such a crucial issue that why like I thought that this could be a platform for letting some of my, I guess, unfiltered, it's, there's a kind of like unfiltered almost thoughts. So the thing that worries me about like too much focus on AI development is that the thing, the set of realities that actually support basic research are not being supported because there's too much effort going to AI development. So if in a future scenario, there happens to be an AI winter, AI development kind of goes through phases. It's like there's activity, then there's a winter, the activity, there's a winter. But if there is a, another AI winter, then there will be some kind of a effect to be seen as a result of uh, not enough cycles going to basic research. So how are that's going to translate into cycles of innovation remains to be seen. But we also have more people uh, today who are scientists and engineers. So that is that could be a counterbalancing option. The thing that worries me though is, is this militaristic uh, approach towards enabling AI. Uh, and I think developing AI systems for the purpose of control and domination could be something that may end up horribly wrong, catastrophically, uh, like, I don't know what the word is. It could be something really bad. Um, just like, uh, yeah, I'm not a military historian, but uh, there were specific events that brought like World War II to an end. So I don't know how we actually um, like explore these topics from a perspective of ethics. Uh, again, like I said, I'm not a military historian. So, but I just worry that you know, I've already shared that uh, these set of developments, as we take a step towards AGI, however that turns out, should not be in the hands of the few. But at the same time, also worried that in the absence of protocols and measures in place whereby mis things like miscommunication or outright adversarial behavior cannot be contained. I just worry that there may be something in the domains of what we categorize as black labs, that something could be unleashed or I, I don't like, we're talking about things that are in the unknown, unknown category at this point, going back, back to Rumsfeld. So th this worries me. Um, there's a schizoid take on this we absolutely need uh, people, uh, sorry, uh, a 
I'm not a big fan of nation state model personally. Uh, I've got a schizoid take on that too, because I live in North America. So I want my community, like, you know, people, like I, I want uh, things to be good and wholesome and uh, for us to use technology for good to increase our standard of living, enable human longevity, make healthcare more accessible, including mental health. And I don't want to suffer. I, I hate suffering. I hate having to, you know, like, um, anyway, but that, this is not about me. But what, what I'm saying right now is, uh, yeah, the opposite of that is also true because yeah, uh, we need folks in uh, different areas of what ought to be categorized as like a uh, standing on one leg uh, uh, ought to be categorized something that is like the nerve center or of the uh, of like a system an institution in this case nation states and uh, you need a architecture of military and intelligence and policy and ethics to and obviously governance uh, to be able to set the guidelines of uh, how to support uh, this development in the first place. So having some portion of uh, the workforce uh, trained in order to be able to uh, be effective in this place is important because to me, it looks like it's going to happen uh, that we're going to take steps to AGI. If not now, 10 years from now, if not 20, if not like at some point in the future, it's going to happen. So so I don't think this is like just like thing is too out. If it happens between now, and there's also this question of where it happens and what kind of scenarios are going to come about. So it depends on who you talk to. There's different schools of thought on on this, but it's a good question that if there's a lot of tension between nation states and the breakthroughs do happen in one specific part of the world, then contingent on what kind of tensions actually exist, what is stopping, like this is where classic game theory kicks in. Like, you know, we can think about, uh, and we should, like it, it seems like inevitable that the world of abundance is gonna be here soon, but a lot of people may not know that. And, you know, there, there may be like scarcity-based mindset, and, like classical, like, you know, like, um, like slice the pie kind of mindset existing. And then there's like all these tensions driven by a whole cluster of problems like, or issues like uh, identity or sorry, identity politics and populism and a whole set of issues. And uh, but like as a continual, like a hypothetical situation, like the, if a particular key breakthroughs happen in one area, what is stopping another area from, I don't think it's gonna actually play out that way because I think this is a joke, but Nation state X is only 12 minutes away from key breakthroughs in nation state Y. So I think there is something to that, but you know, it says a lot about like the kind of world we're living in right now. And there's also that crucial conversation about intellectual property rights. And, but anyway, so this is a complex problem. Uh, this is my take, attempt one on the issue of AI safety uh, democracy is slow. It's cumbersome. I write letters to politicians sometimes. Two out of three don't even reply back. I do get jaded. Uh, sometimes I'm offering to volunteer and they're saying, I don't have time. Sorry, I, the response is we don't have any volunteer opportunities available. And I'm sitting here thinking, really? This is a COVID situation and you're telling me that people want to volunteer, but there's no work. Anyways, I don't... Uh, sit down and think about that too much. What I'm saying is democracy is slow, cumbersome, but it really sucks when you don't have a voice and uh, that's not a good world to live in. Uh, anyone irrespective of like, you know, like it's, people should have a voice and um, because if you don't have freedoms, then there are like, it's not a good trade-off in my opinion. Like if you have material wealth and like all the luxuries in the world, but you don't have freedoms, I don't think it's a good trade-off because it's the way that uh, the minds are conditioned. And like if we have advanced technologies taken off now, it could just be a precursor of something pretty bad. Uh, 
um, whereby uh, you have all the material wealth and all the other things and space travel, but you don't have freedoms. So I don't know. I don't know. That's a different conversation, but I think uh, the consensus, content, like the ability to like actually uh, at the very least take feedback from different segments of society and documenting it. And then having, that's just the means to be able to have all these conversations in distributed fashion and just the ability like for me to talk about the things that are on my mind is very important. Uh, it's, it's a very important facet of this society. And this is why democracy is so important. And I think this is why this topic obviously is very important as well, because I'd love to see uh, the continual development uh, of not just this area, but a lot of these other areas happen for AI development and a lot of other areas for uh, the free fair part of the world. Uh, uh, I'm just thinking like how much I've actually gone back and forth on this topic. Yeah, I, well, I'm not gonna use any comparisons. It, this just makes sense to me. Uh, yeah, I'm not necessarily in the camp of using the government to solve all the problems, so but and I'm not necessarily, I kind of, my political leanings went from like, uh, obviously living in Canada, Commonwealth slash monarchy, uh, just being super honest about this, uh, to like exploring libertarianism, uh, to go into social democracies to slash monarchy. Uh, that's probably where I'm right now, but I personally don't have anything uh, against models of governance in another part of the world. Uh, I'm talking about models of governance. I'm not talking about dictatorships. I haven't thought about that too much. Uh, I don't think we should violently remove dictators, uh, especially the ones that are not hurting their own people. Like, but like I said, I haven't done a lot of it. But like, when it comes to like things like, sorry, uh, modes of governance, like communism, I like I used to be like very skeptical. I, but I don't think you can force a country to change their style of governance. That could end really badly. So, I am like, uh, that's all I gotta say about that topic. And. Um, I hope everything uh, works out, like saner minds prevail. Uh, my philosophy is to work on myself and that's a new challenge by itself. It has been. Um, and I don't promote that. I, like uh, I'm not saying that should be uh, something that you should do as well, but it's a, it's a fair bit of work trying to change yourself and uh, it doesn't happen overnight. It doesn't happen in one year. It's, it's something that's ongoing. It's, it's a lifetime thing. And uh, yeah, I hope, uh, you know, like, um, like I said, say in our mind, may say in our minds prevail. Uh, I hope people, uh, each one of us is able to find uh, genuinely beautiful experiences in our life and so actively work towards cultivating those experiences so that you are richer on the inside and you experience the joys and wonders that each one of these days have has to present for you. I'm working on that too. <laughs> it's not that each one of the days is uh, like sunshine and roses, like some kind of weird chemical flowing through my brain. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I do have beautiful experiences and uh, regardless of whether there will be an advanced AI or not, I think I'll be fine either way. But to me, it sounds like, because um, my goals are to do well for myself. When I do that, I become a better parent and a better partner to wh whoever is going to be in my life in the future and a better father and a better citizen and, you know, community engagement uh, slash. So I just kind of keep things simple and a better entrepreneur. So um, 
what I'm saying is, regardless of what happens in the world of a lot of these uh, technological development, in this case is different because this technology will be conscious. So I don't treat, I, would, I wouldn't treat a intelligence that is human scale, um, same intelligence like, like, you know, like uh, at least my level of intelligence, whatever that is. Uh, I treat it with like the same way I would treat another human being. And uh, yeah, I was gonna say something, I forgot. <laughs> this is my take on, on the topic of AI safety. If, this, if like, I think this is a pretty abstract. Uh, if you are not new to the, sorry, if you're new to the topic of AI safety, a lot of this will not make sense. So I'd encourage you to like read a book or watch uh, at least 10 or 12 of the episodes from the Lex Friedman podcast, like actually watch them consciously, not like while you're munching on, like, like you know, in a distracted format or like uh, when your focus is depleted. Um, uh, the Singularity podcast was called with the, the I forget the guy's name. Singularity weblog is the, is there's some good interviews on on that podcast as well. I don't watch it as much nowadays. Uh, what else? Yeah, I'll just come back to it. Like I'm reviewing myself at this point. Regardless of what happens in the world of AI, I'm still gonna be good. I'm taking the steps to enable my basics and take care of my health, including my mental health and working on becoming a good father. So I'll be good. You know what I mean? I've made some mistakes in the past, so go back, say sorry to those folks. Uh, some pe people have been mean to me. Um, I don't hold any grudges or ill will, just kind of bring those kind of things to an even keel. I don't want to have things sitting on my um, kind of like holding grudges or anything. I don't think I do that anyways, but um, I don't want to be hurt from stuff that happened in the past. And if I may have unintentionally hurt somebody, I want to offer my apologies. So luckily that's not a lot of people, knock on wood. And so that's my philosophy. I hope you gain something from this video. And if you are concerned about the topic of AI safety, I think the best thing to do is to join a accredited institution that is focused on working in this arena. So the best institution that I can think of is probably IEEE. IEEE stands for the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers. And I believe they have a, like a group that is focused on the issue of AI safety. Now, I don't know if it's like in very narrow domains like autonomous cars or something else, but I have been a member of IEEE and I got a lot of value out of being a member. Anyone can be a member of IEEE. You don't have to have an engineering designation and you will get tons of value out, out of doing so as well. It includes access to certain societies that you can join. No affliction to, I guess, Minsky Society of Mind. But uh, yeah, you can join IEEE societies whereby you can engage in conversations like this and play an active role towards uh, either observing or contributing or both on very important issues like this. The thing that I like about IEEE is it's truly global, cooperative, and inclusive. They probably have a representation from every single country in the world. So I see when I look at their medals and honors, people from all the different parts of the world are being cherished and celebrated for their achievements. And it includes like North America, Europe, uh, Asia, Middle East, everywhere, Russia, everywhere. So I, I think IEEE is probably the best uh, area to start this conversation, but the, the other arenas as well, I think the uh, narrative is as structured and I think what's really needed for such an, this important topic is like a structure slash inclusive uh, engagement, I think, I'm not sure. Thanks for watching. Bye.